Business 51 Public Informational Meeting No. 4, recorded October 6, 2022. So first of all, thank you all for coming uh, to uh, yet another meeting regarding Business 51. We appreciate the input and hopefully we can make progress. A few ground rules um, and housekeeping items. Restrooms, if you haven't seen them yet, are out the doors. Men's is to my right. Ladies is to my left. Um, let's see, what else? We've got several cameras here. We have the microphones. Please use your outside voice so we can make sure and pick them up on the microphones. This is not live stream because we didn't have the technology easily to do that, but it will be recorded and available on our website probably within the next day or so uh, for recaps. Um, I did ask for a few, quest few people for questions ahead of time if they had any. We didn't get a whole lot, so hopefully you've come prepared to ask questions today. Yep. We are going to be respectful. We're going to try to be as constructive as possible. Thanks, Brock. Live streaming? <laughs> anyway, we're going to be respectful of each other, whether or not we disagree. That is a ground rule. We are here to make progress, not to call names, point fingers, and generally be mean. We see that, I'm going to stop you. Um, all questions relating to Business 51 are on the table. I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to ask the questions that they need answers to. We have representatives here, uh, three of them from AECOM, Bill Schilling, Logan Dredsky, and Jeff Sandberg from AECOM. We also have the Shannon Riley from the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. We have Public Works Director, Scott Badoon, Public Utilities Director for the City, Joel Lemke, Community Development Director, Ryan Karnowski, Fire Department Chief J.B. Moody, Police Department Chief Bob Cuso, and several older persons. Older persons, why don't you raise your hand just so people know who you are, where you are. All right, so we have resources to try and answer every single question you might have. The format is going to be a presentation from AECOM. That presentation is going to be about 15, 20 minutes to talk about how we got to where we are and changes that have been made since that contentious September meeting. There have been changes made after our meetings with businesses and property owners, uh, especially on that south side. So we'll let them do their presentation and then we're going to open up the floor to questions. We'll ask, uh, I'll try and see that and if we have questions, we're going to have you come up to the microphone, uh, tell us your name and address, and then ask your questions, directing it at the stage. And then we'll have the most appropriate person try and answer your questions for you. Uh, there are some documents in the back. Uh, the layout that you see there is the most current uh, proposal. And keep in mind that we are only going to a 30% design at this point, so there's still room for some changes uh, before we move along. However, we want to make sure that we have a good product. This is arguably going to be the biggest thing that any of us are dealing with in our lifetime. So we want to make sure and do it right, something that works for the most people, um, and try and keep an open mind about it as much as you can. I understand it's very divisive, uh, but try and understand the other person's point of view. Again, be respectful and productive in your actions. We want to make sure that we have everyone who needs to <coughs> has an opportunity to ask their question and get it answered, uh, and we're going to try and show as much respect to that as we can. Before we get started, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. You can only ask one question? No, I mean, do you have a list? Yeah. How many? Probably three. Three should be fine. We want to be respectful of everybody's time, though, right? Yeah. Uh, let me see a show of hands. How many people intend right now to ask at least one question? All right, so look around you. We're going to have about an hour and 40 minutes to try and get to those. So try and be respectful of other people's time. That's why I ask people to give them to me ahead of time to put out an FAQ. Uh, we're going to get through as many as we can and try and wrap up about 8.30. If you have three questions, ask your three questions. Anything else? All right, and I am going to turn it over to Bill, and we're going to get this thing rolling. All right, is this on? Can we, this is good? No? You'll have to get a little closer, I think, because their microphone isn't as... All right, how's that? 
Better? All right. Outside All right. voice. Outside voice. All right, make sure this works here. Okay. Don't get that close. <laughs> well, thanks, Mayor. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. I just want to uh, make a quick thank you to, uh, to everybody. You know, we, just, we, we want to have your continued support on this project and appreciate any feedback, and that's the purpose of tonight. As the mayor did mention, uh, tonight what we have was a real short presentation. We want to go back and give you a, a, a history of the project, sort of the decision-making process we went through, and then you know get a direction forward on this project. So um, I brought with me a couple folks, other folks may come, which the mayor already introduced. They're going to help me through this presentation. Um, hold on. All right, so Business 51 corridor, as we know, it's about three miles long that runs from the South Project limits up to North Point Drive. The uh, traffic volumes do range from about 8,400 vehicles to 13,600 vehicles per day. Um, one item of note is that we are continuously getting new traffic numbers, and we do have some updates from this past year, 2021, you can see at various locations throughout the project. For the alternative development process that we've already kind of gone through, we, we began by breaking this up into three segments. As you all know, the south segment goes from the south city limits up through Patch. The central segment is Patch through 4th Avenue and the north section, 4th Avenue through North Point Drive. And as, as you know, each segment does have provide its own challenges and that's kind of where those, where those got broken up and for the purposes of that. Quick review of where we've been as far as the public involvement to date. Um, there's been three rounds, major rounds of public involvement uh, prior to today, beginning in the fall of 2020. Uh, due to COVID, there was no in-person uh, public meetings prior to the July of 2021 round um, that we had, but we have uh, had several other ways to learn about the project, to provide feedback to our project team throughout the process. Uh, within this past year, we have had two, uh, two rounds of property owner meetings, meeting with the businesses and other properties in the south segment. And prior to, as the mayor had mentioned, our next step is to get, try to get towards that 30%. So prior to even getting towards that 30%, we do plan on engaging further with the central folks and the north, uh, north section property property owners on those, so. All right, so with any study, one of the first things you wanted to do is define the, the project purpose and need. Um, you know, the purpose of the Business 51 project is really to address a, a number of things from pavement, safety, and multimodal needs um, of the corridor. While, this is key, while, while, while ensuring efficient traffic flow, uh, the pavement, I get, it, it speaks for itself. Everyone's driven Business 51, and you know the pavement is in rough shape uh, throughout the corridor. Um, in addition to that, the utilities, especially on, within that south segment, do need to be replaced as part of the project. Um, improving safety, however, is one of the biggest corridor needs. Uh, crashes were bad when the study first began back in 2012, and they've only gotten worse since then, and we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that. Um, conditions for pedestrians and bicyclists are also less than ideal. The sidewalk is often immediately adjacent to the roadway and there are no pedestrian islands within the middle of the road for crossing. Um, you will note that improving traffic flow is not listed as a need on this, on this slide. Um, since 2005, the overall traffic on Business 51 has been declining and current traffic operations do fall within an acceptable range uh, for the corridor, all along the corridor. Uh, but with that said, the goal of any reconstruction of this corridor is to maintain that, that efficient traffic flow. So you're gonna hear a lot of things today, but one thing I, I, I think you'll want to remember from today is wh why do we need to make changes to the design of the roadway? Uh, and the main area is we need to improve the safety. Um, we can do better with, with the existing roadway than it is today for automobiles, for pedestrians, for bicyclists, for, for everyone, no matter how they choose to, to get around within the corridor. As I mentioned, the crashes were bad 
when we first studied this back in 2012 through 2013, um, they're worse now. Business 51 north of Ellis Street um, has a higher crash rate than 95% of similar roadways within the state of Wisconsin based on numbers that we've received from the DOT. The crash rate is a function of both the number of vehicles and use, number of vehicles using the roadway and the, the pure number of crashes within the corridor. As you can see here, the, the darker the red, the higher that rate of crash, the higher crash rate there is in that area. The alternatives that uh, you've seen and, and you'll see again today, um, we hope and, and, and we, they do have the potential to reduce traffic crashes between 20 and 50% depending on the location within the corridor. So from the start of the study, several preliminary alternatives were looked at and were considered for this corridor. Um, the first is obviously the, the no build alternative, which just simply means let's do nothing and just continue the, the, the yearly maintenance on the roadway. We also looked at the one way pair alternative that would utilize Business 51 and Michigan Avenue, kind of runs similar to the way Maine and Clark runs today. And then we also looked at two lane and four lane alternatives that would reconstruct the roadway with either a center raised median or a center two way left turn lane, which is the acronym is twiddle. I'm sure you've seen that. So at that point within our, our study process, uh, we engaged with key stakeholders. Uh, there was a number of stakeholder committee meetings uh, comprised of business owners, residents, uh, elected officials, et cetera, um, and also began our public involvement process. The key takeaways we heard from you on that is that efficient traffic flow must be maintained. Alternatives should utilize the existing right of way as much as possible, limiting impacts to businesses, limiting impacts to, to properties. And pedestrian accommodations should be prioritized over bicycle accommodations if the right of way is limited. Oh, got to click more apparently. So after considering the preliminary alternatives through this engagement process, the alternatives shown here uh, were considered reasonable and feasible and selected for a more detailed evaluation. The two-lane alternatives uh, with either the raised median or the, or the two-lane with the twiddle in the middle were considered for the in, entire corridor. And four-lane alternatives were considered for the north segment between 4th and North Point Drive and also within that south segment from the south limits to Michigan Avenue. At this point, I would like to bring Jeff on and he's gonna talk about some, some common questions we've heard over the past uh, year or two. Okay, thanks Bill. Yep, so I'm just gonna touch on some common questions that we've heard throughout the, uh, the planning process. Um, the first one of those is why were four lane alternatives not considered between Michigan Avenue and 4th Avenue? Uh, in fact, as Bill just uh, described in the last slide, in the preliminary stages we did look at some four lane alternatives, but what we found was that in this stretch, uh, those alternatives were very, um, well that area has much more limited right of way and there are a lot of um, buildings right up to the back of the sidewalk. Uh, so those alternatives were very impactful, and we considered those to be not feasible due to those impacts. Can you raise your mic? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll try to lean in a little bit more here. Um, the next question that we heard was, why not repave Business 51 as it is? So if you recall from earlier in the presentation, uh, we had three primary needs for the project, improve pavement, improve safety, and improve uh, bike and pedestrian accommodations. So repaving it the way it is would take care of that first uh, need, improving the pavement, but it wouldn't improve safety and it wouldn't improve the uh, bicycle and pedestrian accommodations. Uh, another question that we've heard is, if we are to repave Business 51 and leave it the way it is, would there still be some of the access consolidations that have been included in some preliminary alternatives? And the short answer to that is yes, we still would consider those same consolidations. Um, currently city policy is for parcels to have a single access. 
Um, and an example of that is a redevelopment of the Burger King site that happened recently. Um, as you can see, previously there was two driveways on that site, and once it was redeveloped, um, it ended up with a single driveway. Um, we've also heard a lot of concern about um, do lane, redu or lane restrictions work um, at a, a road like Business 51 with this level of traffic volumes. Uh, so we did pull together some uh, similar road diets that have been performed throughout the state. Uh, and we've also included their AADT, which is average annual daily traffic, which is a measure of how much traffic's going through there every day. And you can see in Business 51, that volume is between 8,400 and 13,600 vehicles per day. And that puts us kind of right in the middle of that, uh, the range of different uh, similar roads that we've looked at. So kind of indicates that we're, we're in that range where this uh, should operate acceptably. And we've also had, uh, we've heard some concerns, um, you know, if we put in this road diet, is traffic gonna divert elsewhere? Is it gonna avoid business 51 altogether? And one of those uh, options that we, or locations that I mentioned was right here in Stevens Point on Stanley Street. Um, as you can see, we had uh, traffic volumes taken in 2017 and also in 2021 after that road diet was implemented. And you'll see that the, the traffic volumes actually went up in that period, which is an indication that uh, people are not necessarily avoiding Stanley Street at this point. So with that, I'm gonna invite uh, Logan up to talk about um, the detailed alternatives. Thanks, Jeff. So as you heard earlier in the presentation, there were preliminary alternatives that were reviewed and refined, and they resulted in what is known as the detailed alternatives. These detailed alternatives had to undergo further evaluation in order to identify the recommended alternatives. And to help us do that, we developed this criteria that you see here in a scoring system. And the purpose of developing this criteria in a scoring system was to give us a measurable way to compare the alternatives to one another. So in areas such as you see here, where we had multiple alternatives, we took that criteria, we took that scoring system, and we applied it to figure out which alternative scored the highest. And by scoring the highest, it had the highest score. So there's details on the project website that go through the criteria and the actual results of the evaluation, but these next few slides are just gonna quickly go through some of the high level reasons of why alternatives were recommended. So starting in the cell segment, in the cell segment, the two lane with the two way left turn lane was recommended over the four lane with the raised median. And the primary reason that it was recommended was because it required less right of way and it did not have any relocations compared to the four lane with the raised median. Also in the cell segment, there were a few intersections where we looked at specific intersection improvements. Um, one being Rice Street, where we had an option to realign the intersection or we could keep it at its existing alignment. And here, actually the alternatives, they scored the same. However, the option for realigning the intersection was recommended because of the safety, traffic operations, and connectivity improvements that it would have. Um, a similar situation was at Pass Street where we had an option to keep the existing alignment and then two options to look at realigning the intersection. And the option that you see here on the screen in the lower left, that was the option that was recommended over the other realignment option, primarily because it required less right of way and it had less relocations. So in the central segment, uh, most of the central segment only had one option, so there wasn't an evaluation. And the reason that it only had one option, as we mentioned before, is the roadway has a limited right-of-way in that area, and there's a lot of homes that are close to the right-of-way. So an alternative that goes outside the existing right-of-way could be pretty impactful. However, between Ellis Street and College Avenue, there was two alternatives considered. Um, both of these alternatives included a through lane in each direction, and a left turn lane in each direction, looking very similar to how it looks today. The one difference is that the option that was recommended included a small narrow raised median in the center, as well as a six foot grass terrace between the roadway and the sidewalk. 
And it was recommended because that um, raised median between or in the center of the roadway, it helps with access in between those two closely spaced intersections of Clark Street and Main Street with vehicles turning left into driveways. Uh, and then also the, the grass terrace that was part of this option had benefits for pedestrians where it provided a little bit of buffer between the sidewalk and the roadway. Uh, lastly, in the central segment, um, the 4th Avenue intersection, here there are two options analyzed. There was a signalized option and a roundabout option. The roundabout option was recommended because it does a better job of slowing vehicles through the intersection. And it also allows for pedestrians who are crossing there to only have to cross one lane of traffic at a time, excuse me, one direction of traffic at a time. So we, we do know that there's been some concerns in regards to the signalized versus roundabout option. And it's something that will continue to be analyzed to make sure that it's suitable for pedestrians as we move on in design. Lastly is the north segment. Um, here, the two lane with the raised median was recommended over the four lane with the raised median with the primary reason being that it had a lower cost, it provided safer east-west crossings for pedestrians, and then it also had a buffered bicycle lane um, compared to one that did not have a buffered bicycle lane. So the alternatives that you see here, these comprise the recommended alternatives for the Business 51 corridor. These recommended alternatives were approved by the Common Council in the fall of 2021. Since then, we've had, as we mentioned earlier, we've had meetings with some of the south segment property owners to talk about property-specific concerns. So one example of those concerns was related to access and access changes. So here's an example of um, an access change that we made after we got feedback working with a business owner to make sure that they had adequate access to their business. Another example, or another type of updates we made um, included some realignments at the intersections. So we realigned the curvature of our design to try and minimize impacts to adjacent property owners. So um, in total, you can see here there's 11 access changes, but we've had these conversations with the south segment business owners and property owners, and we will have conversations with central segment and north segment property owners as we move on and before we complete our 30% design. So I'm going to pass it off to Scott, and he's going to talk about the next steps moving forward for the project. Thank you, Logan. Uh, just a, f a couple of slides left before we go to q and I just want to give everybody just a, a general high-level view of kind of like where are we headed. Um, so that question, though, is just in and of itself not the easiest to, to answer, simply because the cost of the overall project we have. We're talking about a project that's tens of millions of dollars and similar to what we've seen to the south of us, uh, you know, it's gonna take several years over several phases to complete the work. Uh, and so part of that, of course, is gonna be governed by where are we gonna get the money to do this? And so the order of which we attack this project uh, and break it up um, is gonna be significantly impacted by that question. Where is the money gonna come from? Uh, as you can see here on the slide, you know, we do have some of that funding already available, and that funding currently exists on the north end. Uh, that is part of the tax incremental district, and there is funding there which will pay for the majority, if not all, of this project. So that's an area we're going to otherwise work at because the funding is there. One of the caveats with that is the expenditure period, and I won't get into the details of, uh, of TIDS, um, I'm not the expert on that anyways, is that there is an expenditure period, so we have until 27 to expend that money, or we need to start giving it back to uh, the various other entities, the county school district and such. So it is in our best interest to move forward on this relatively quickly um, to get there so that we aren't burdening the taxpayers with that additional expense. Uh, within the central segment at the moment, we haven't identified any other funding sources. So to say it at the moment, you know, it's locally funded. However, we will be pursuing and looking at other grant opportunities and other funding mechanisms that uh, may present themselves. So even though I say locally funded today, doesn't necessarily mean that it is, but snapshot in time, you know, this is kind of where we, where we are. So uh, we're still looking for that. Uh, however, then in the south segment, though, we have kind of a mix of things. Uh, it, we have recently uh, been awarded a grant through uh, the Department of Transportation, uh, part of their surface transportation program. Uh, and that is the, you know, 
apply to just a portion of the south segment, roughly about a third of it, so about a half a mile stretch or so uh, of that from the south city limits to Michigan Avenue to help us with that funding. Uh, and that would, of course, we'll get that kick-started to there, so that's an 80-20 split, so the majority of it could be picked up through that grant. However, of course, there are expenditure periods through the grant as well, so that also will play into it. And then the remainder portion of that from Michigan up to uh, Pat Street, that's that south segment as we delineated, you know, at this point in time we haven't identified an additional funding source, uh, so we'll have to see how that works out into the overall schedule. So with that, how does that otherwise work out? Well, uh, can't otherwise read that from here. I guess I need to, I don't know if they make cheaters for this distance. But the south side of that, if I'm reading that right, yeah, I'm not sure I can see that any better, unfortunately. Now I gotta focus again. All right, so project schedule, getting a little ahead of myself, that's why I couldn't understand what was written on there. Um, as Logan has otherwise identified and has been said, you know, we have met with some of the property owners, you know, already on the sell side and started to implement those changes, which is just part of the process that we need to get there. We, we came up with the recommended alternative and now we need to refine that. And we knew even at the time when we made that recommendation, you know, we weren't done yet. And so we've had some of those, a couple of rounds of, of, of those meetings. Uh, and we will do the same for central and north segment uh, because we, we definitely need some feedback. We, you know, we understand how the road would work, but we don't necessarily know the intricacies of the building. How do you receive deliveries? You know, how is these things otherwise, you know, done? What is your traffic flow? You know, what sort of vehicles otherwise you use your, your entranceways? So we need to get an understanding of that, and we will do that as we proceed then to the next item on here, which is the 30% design. And as the mayor indicated at the beginning, that's their target right at the moment. That's what we've hired AECOM as our consultant to do for us, which is to get us to that point. And what that otherwise is, is you know, a, a somewhat more detailed design to what you see in the back, but based upon there, to take it there. And what we do you know, through that 30 cent design is look through a lot of these conflicts that they may otherwise come up. So again, we're gonna be looking at access control and trying to refine that. Uh, so we can try to make you know, whatever compromises we can, you know, safety and what businesses otherwise need to operate successfully, because um, we don't want to impact that. Uh, there's no reason to just make an impact to make an impact. Uh, we want to always have justification for the actions we take. Uh, as well as then we'll be looking at some of the other real estate needs we have because, you know, we look at it from a high level view, everything seems to fit. We need to apply that in the details it is to see that it actually does indeed fit within the space we have. And then otherwise we may have to make some modifications and changes, you know, within there. So that 30% design at the end should give us a very good handle of, you know, how is it always going to fit? What are some of those nuances and, and details of design? You know, and, and do we need additional real estate or what are those constraints? As well as then giving us a good handle on getting a final, you know, preliminary estimate of the work to be done so we know exactly what we're talking about as far as, as expenditures. So with all that others put together at the bottom of the slide, as I'm sure you've already well ahead of me as I talk here to see what those are, uh, you know, the north section is where we're going to start. You know, and I'd say as early as 24, let's say 24, 25 be the time frame, because again, we need to be finished in 27 if we're going to utilize the funds that are available. Uh, with the south segment, so we have grant funding, that would be the next area that we'd be looking at, simply because we have to follow the expenditures. So we're looking at maybe as early as 26, but otherwise the 27, 28 time frame in there. <clears throat> the others will otherwise, you know, fall, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of in line. So the central segment at the moment, at least, you know, it's probably going to be of the last to be completed. You know, and of course, this is all subject to change if we can find yet additional funding that might help us with some of those. Because I said that's going to be a driving force for what we do, you know, as the, as a city. Because we can't afford to do it all uh, right now, and so we're going to have to find that funding. But as you can see from this, this is not going to happen in the next year or two. And even once we get started, it's going to take a period of time before we're finally completed with everything. So it's, you know, whatever we even talk about today is not going to be implemented tomorrow. Um, so hopefully the, the conversation continues as we go. And so with that, um, if you have comments today, we're expecting comments in the back. If you have a comment later, whatever, feel free to contact myself uh, and, and just let me know what you're, you're thinking about things. You know, we love to hear them. You know, it doesn't necessarily matter, you know, what it is. We love all the constructive criticism we can get. And with that, I think we did pretty good on, on that. Hopefully kept it short. And then we're going to move to turn it over back over to the mayor and we'll go to the Q&A. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, so that tells us where we've been and how we got to where we are today. Uh, we did have a couple of questions that I got submitted beforehand. 
So I'm going to ask those now, and I'm going to ask uh, our representatives here to come up and answer them. Um, before we do that, there's some vague questions that were out there too. Is one of them was, why can't you keep it four lanes? Well, we can. It's not the best option. I wouldn't recommend that option. And as you saw, four lanes was actually evaluated in some of the sections. They didn't score as high. Does that mean we can't do it? No, it doesn't. But it doesn't check all the boxes. Um, so we're trying to check as many boxes as we can for improvements because we're all going to have to live with this. I said this earlier, it's probably the biggest project we'll have to deal with in our lifetime. So we want to make sure we do the best one. Um, I'm not exactly sure what this one means, but it says, what mechanism does the city have to put the lion's share of the extra costs, not all of them of course, for the road expansion on those beneficiaries, meaning the south side businesses? Uh, the bottom line is there isn't a good mechanism to do that, nor would we do that to the homeowners in the second section or the business owners in the third section. Uh, these are community projects. They're paid for by the community. There are special exceptions, uh, special assessments that we could do potentially, uh, or tax incremental financing as you saw in some of that. But the bottom line is that's not something that we would uh, likely consider. The next one I'm going to ask uh, AECOM, and I know Shannon's here from the DOT. What is the minimum allowed lane widths by the DOT standards? And what is the recommended lane widths? And was the recommendation from AECOM based on the minimum or the recommended standards? Bill, do you want to take that, whoever? Sure. So to answer the question about the lane widths, um, we, so this roadway is currently under the jurisdiction of the city of Stevens Point. It is part of the national highway system. So there are some criteria there that applies to the WSDOT standards. Um, but the design criteria that we put together for this project lists the lane width as 11 to 12 foot as the recommended and 10 foot as the minimum. Most of the alternatives in this project have a 11 foot lane width and there are a couple turn lanes that do have a 10 foot lane width. Thank you. Um, this one, Shannon, I don't know if you can answer this. Where Shannon sit? There he is. Um, so I don't know if you can answer this, uh, maybe just to the best of your ability, because I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but um, would a four lane design in the north and south segments and a three lane in the center section prohibit us from getting grants? The answer is no. Um, no, I, I guess I can expand on that. Uh, could you come up to at least one of the, rec the the microphones, whether it's this one or that one, just so we have it on the recording? Okay, can you can you hear me here? Okay, the the cross section that the city chooses for the project, um, the the funding is not pre precluded on that at all. So it's the city's decision. They'll bring that forward. Uh, for the DOT to review, and as long as that meets the federal standards uh, and state guidance that we have for the project, it would qualify for the funding. Thank you. Um, and this one, I, again, we've talked about this a couple of times. I'll have someone from AECOM talk uh, about this. Why does reducing the number of driveways make it safer? Yep, I can handle that one. So uh, the number of driveways along a corridor, uh, the, the more access you have along a corridor, the more potential you have for crashes at each one of those access points. And when you have a high number of them along a corridor, they start to interact with each other and they make a, a situation where vehicles can be in conflict more frequently. Um, so there's, there's several studies that have been done on access and, and the, the conclusion is always that reducing access uh, makes for, for safer roads. Thank you. Okay, that exhausts all of the questions that I had submitted ahead of time. Director Badoon, you didn't have any questions submitted to your office, did you? I did not receive any. Director Kronoski, anything from your office? No. Director Lemke, Chief Moody, no. Chief Cuso? Okay, so then what we'll do is we'll open it up to the floor. We've got about, uh, about an hour and a half. I'm gonna start on this end, 
and work my way this way. So have your question prepared. We're gonna ask you to come up to the microphone in the center. Get close, use your outside voice so we can pick it up on camera because again, we're not live streaming, but we are recording it and we wanna make sure people uh, have the ability to, to listen to your questions and, and the answers. So, just a, a show of hands and I'll call on you. Yes, sir, come on down. And then I'm gonna get someone on deck right away. Who's the next person? Anyone else? Anyone up there? You, sir. We'll get you on deck. Come on down so you can, uh, so we try and minimize the travel time. As a matter of fact, if we want to go this way, we can start queuing up along the front. So anybody in this first top section or these two middle sections, or two sections on this side, if you have a question, come on down and, and we'll try and get them answered quickly. Okay. Name and address, sir. Ah, John Rock, 500 Summer Street. I John Rock, 500 Summer Street. Two questions. One is on the estimating. Is that include the uh, underground work, the sewer and the water? And if so, was that cost that I included in the estimate? And is that uh, a cost that would be borne by the taxpayer or by the utility company? Okay. And I don't need an answer right now. But we're gonna give you an answer right now. That's what okay. we're here for. Were those estimates? They were included as sort of a percentage because we're very early on in the project. As far as who bears that cost? That'll be the, so all the underground stuff is gonna be the utility. Okay. That one I can tell you for sure. Um, but yes, the cost was included. Okay. All right. S second question is, uh, this alternatives you have with the two lane and the tweeter lane, if that's so good, why don't we do it next year? We got a paint truck we just bought paint it and you'll have it on the ground we can use it for the next 10 years and if it works great if it doesn't work it's back to the drawing board okay generally i can answer that question for you it's not going to give you the same effect it's not as easy as it was on stanley street where it was just paint this one's going to have some dedicated turn lanes raised medians and those things are going to be difficult to to simulate with paint you could do it with paint, you could do it with cones. It can be done if you want to do it. Let's put it that way. DOT, do you want to chime in on this one at all? It's, is that something that is normal practice? So you could, this is something we could do with paint? Well, yeah, that would be on your own, not part of our project. Okay. So the DOT doesn't have any issue with that. Acom, what's your experience in doing that? Well, I think you we we got to get up here. It. Yeah, you actually touched on it a little bit. You know, just uh, simply painting the, the two-lane twiddle as it is today is not going to have the same effect because we are doing a lot of improvements at the intersections. We're doing a lot of access control changes, things like that, um, to make it a more efficient three-lane or two-lane twiddle, as you like to call it. So I don't think it would have the same effect. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, Joe Searin, uh, Stevens Point. My first question is, while you were researching this project, did you review any of the research that Whiting and Plover did to ultimately come up with their four lanes and bike lanes while maintaining a 35 and 30 mile per hour speed limits? Yeah, I can take a stab at that one. Um, so we were, we're, we're very aware of what uh, was happening down in Plover and Whiting um, at the same time as this one. I think the, the main thing is that when we do studies like this, ultimately we end up with alternatives that are, are, are the best fit for that context. Uh, down in Plover and Whiting was a little bit of a, uh, a different context. The, the right-of-way, they had more right-of-way to work with down there. The buildings were set back a little bit further from, from the roadway. Um, so we're a little bit more constrained. So I think that's why you, you see we took a, a little bit different approach than what happened down there. Okay. Um, so what differs, because I look at the north side, which seems to have a lot of room uh, for, uh, we wouldn't have to take up a lot of properties. South side seems the same way. So what differs from Plover and Whiting uh, compared to the south side and north side portions and please don't say cost because you have the TIF money involved, you have the grant money that's still there, so cost shouldn't be a factor. We're looking at, uh, obviously you don't want to take properties, but the north side 
already has a, enough room that I don't see there being properties that would have to be taken. And I think for the most part, the south side would be the same way. So what are the differences? Yeah, to touch on the difference between the south segment and the north segment, um, they are two different situations in themselves. So in the north segment, there is room to fit the four lane with the raised median and the two lane with the raised median. So the room really isn't the issue. When it came down to the criteria that we walked through before and looked at that scoring, the difference that really came out um, was some of the multimodal accommodations that could be included with the two lane versus the four lane having uh, fewer lanes of traffic for pedestrians to cross in that area where there are a lot of pedestrian crossings. And then also the improved bike lanes with the buffered strip between them and the vehicles. Um, in the south segment, I think the big thing there is that when you're comparing between a two lane and a four lane roadway, the two lane with the two way left turn lane that's recommended, that can fit within the existing right of way. <clears throat> A four lane that meets the purpose and need of this study requires a raised median. And when you have that raised median, that requires additional right of way for that four lane um, typical section. And it does get impactful in terms of relocations right away and things of that nature. Okay. Final question will be if we would to do for the north side and south side four lanes and do the two lanes for the center section. What do the studies say about the traffic flow going from a two lane to a you know, four lane to a two lane and back and forth? How, what's, the, what's that impact? How, how horrible or is that an acceptable uh, pattern? I think from, uh, obviously you don't want to be going from a back and forth from a four lane to a two lane to a four lane, because every time you have a merge point, that's a, another access, or not an access, another point where there could be potential conflict. Um, but the reality is it's four lanes down in, in Plover and Whiting. Uh, the preferred alternative here is goes to two lanes, and then at some point up in the north segment, it's gonna open back up to four lanes. Um, depending on exactly where those transi transitions occur. Um, there could be some difference in terms of, of what options are better, but I think that's it would be pretty similar either way. It's just a, a matter of where are we making those transition points. So to clarify that, when you go from two lane to four lane, crash impacts, accidents, what's, what, are the, what do the statistics say about that? going from a two lane to four lane or four lane down to two lane, because you're gonna have to have merging going on. Is that a, is that a nightmare? What, what happens? What do the statistics say? Well, that's anywhere you have a, a merge point, there's potential for, for crashes there. Uh, that has to be taken in, into account into the bigger picture. Um, why are you merging traffic? What does uh, the crash frequency look like for the entire segment? But certainly that is a consideration. Okay, what, what does the statistic say? I don't know the exact statistic offhand, but generally merge points do are associated with some crash risk. Okay, good, thank you. Hear me? Andy Sahusky, 2900 Prontnac. Uh, just two questions I got. The first one, um, concerning the central segment, I don't know. If Director Badoon might answer this, but in regards because of how it's constricted in there, like with garbage pickup and all that, because you're not going to have the buffer lane, like with the bike lane there. Um, was that taken into consideration in that section on how traffic's going to flow? Uh, yes, to answer that question, we, we did consider it. Um, and again, as, as Jeff Sandberg just otherwise mentioned, you know, we have to look at it in a greater context. We have enough room there with the twiddle, so there's the kind of reality of you set it up with a dedicated lane. As you're taking that curb lane, you know, there's also the practical component of it. You know, how frequently does it happen? It's, it's once a week through a section. Um, and, you know, if we're otherwise practical, what normally happens if you have a linear arrangement, and Jeff can speak to this and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, is that is that you know traffic will most likely just turn 
and, and go around in the twiddle, much like they do you know, currently from one lane to another lane. However, you don't have to worry about side swiping you know, in this. So there's the practical aspect of how do people behave in that situation, as well as just kind of the, also the frequency and what is the, the potential. And it all has to be balanced out. So. And then, yep, yeah, and then like part two for that, um, with the bus stops too, because there's currently nine bus stops on the south side. Correct, and, and, side. And, and we're working on that, and we're actually working with the, the transit to, you know, kind of reevaluate those bus stops and see how it works. One of the things that we're working through and will do through the 30% design is look at specifically at what that, you know, looks like. You know, will they remain just as they are now at the curb? You know, will there be some sort of yet pullout? You know, we're looking to put that six foot, you know, uh, buffer there between the, the back of curb and the sidewalk as, you know, for pedestrian accommodations. Uh, but maybe in some locations we'll actually pull that curb tight there. We haven't made that decision. We need to talk with transit to also see how that is and see how their routes. I know right now many of the routes, you know, they have their stops right there, but they don't have even as many stops, I think, as they would desire to have it because right now they have concerns about how that road operates. Uh, so that's something we're going to be working through more through the 30% design. Thank you. And then my second question is going more about um, with the AD, AADD counts, traffic counts, are they going to do a current one for like this year to kind of show what's going on? Because I know they did some in 2021. Let, let, let's rephrase the question. How frequently will you be doing traffic counts along this whole corridor during the entire process? Is that fair? Yeah. Well, and I'm guessing, Shannon, you probably don't know the answer to this, but typically WISDOT does uh, traffic counts on a period of every three to four years. Um, I don't think they would probably change that just because we're doing a project, so I would expect that to continue. Okay. So it'll probably be a few more years before they do another one. And I can also chime into that. We're not doing necessarily every intersection, but there are a few of them look like 4th Avenue, uh, Nebel Street, are two primarily that we internally at the city have some cameras specifically for the purpose of traffic counting. We're not necessarily getting all that video counted at the moment, but we're trying to capture at least one or two times a year um, throughout that corridor. It's again, not every intersection, uh, but definitely some of them, like the Fourth Avenue one, we typically capture twice a year, uh, every spring and every fall, just because we want to gather the additional data. So as we proceed with this, we will be looking at that to see if anything changes as we go through this process you know, to see that if we need to also then make it, you know, some changes. Thank you. You're up. I think, I think most of my questions are in. No. Perfect. No, Anyone no, else in the, these two sections or that section up there that hasn't uh, asked yet, queue up, please. And remember, outside voice, lean into the microphone a little bit. What? I didn't hear you. All right. Uh, my name is Jim Horan. I live at 1501 Michigan Avenue. First question. Has the city purchased the land that the store and cousin subs are on right now? No. If you put the roundabout in there, are you going to have to purchase that land? And what are you going to do with the bank? on the other corner and the apartment house on the other corner. So the properties that you mentioned, the gas station and the cousin subs, and actually I believe it is in the southwest quadrant and the southeast quadrant are the properties that would be required to be purchased for the roundabout. Those properties would also be required to be purchased for the signalized option as well due to the necessary intersection configuration to, for the lane operations and make them operate efficiently. I, could you go, with, go over that again? <clears throat> so for the roundabout option and the signalized option, both of them have similar levels of impacts at the 4th Avenue intersection. There would be a relocation required in the southwest corner of that intersection and one in the southeast corner of that intersection. And those are similar for both the signalized and the roundabout options. Still didn't answer my question. I still don't get What happens? Yeah. For the roundabout, do you have to purchase the property the gas station was on and the property that Cousin Subs is on? What are you going to do with 
decide where the bank is on and decide where there's an apartment building or apartment houses or whatever that thing is. And I'll take it because I think I can understand um, where you're coming from. Property will have to be purchased on all four corners. Right. It will not affect the businesses on all four corners. The bank will stay where it is. The apartments where the potato place used to be yeah. will, won't, won't be affected. <coughs> uh, right? Oh, Cousins won't. I apologize. Cousins won't be affected. Um, the two on the south side will be affected and they will likely have to have the ta whole property taken in either option. How much money do you save if we don't put the roundabout in? Well, we don't know yet because the property acquisition, as he mentioned, is similar. Because if we don't put the roundabout in and we go with a signalized intersection, you're still going to want dedicated turn lanes, so you will expand the footprint of that intersection. Does that make sense? It won't be done as it is right now. But it'd be a lot cheaper than doing a roundabout. Cheap isn't always better, I get it. But yes, yeah. you're right. No, I, Either option could be okay. Now, the other thing, the other question is, and you still haven't convinced me with what you've been saying. They say business 51 has to be put on a traffic diet. So with, everybody's saying business 51 needs to go on a traffic diet, right? Where does that traffic go to? Yeah, so the, we're not anticipating that any traffic is going to divert and go to alternate routes. The, the roadway as proposed would be able to handle all the traffic that's there today. Really? <laughs> I'm not going to promise you're going to agree with everything that's said no, up here, but I'm, we're going to no, give you the honest I'm, answers. I'm being polite. Yep. I'm just trying to get the facts out. I want people to understand, you know, I live on Michigan Avenue, and trust me, the traffic on Michigan Avenue has increased, ready, since that roundabout was put, put out by Century. It has, and I don't need any more traffic on Michigan Avenue. Understood, we have to move along though. If you have I'm questions, qualified. great. I got my three in. Thank you, sir. Mr. Omira. Pedestrian and bicycle facilities are proposed all along this corridor. As far as safety goes, won't the safety for the pedestrians, the bicyclists, and the automobiles be increased if those facilities are installed? Uh, the short answer is yes. So uh, with uh, what, what's been proposed, uh, we expect uh, safety be, to be improved by about 30 to 35 percent uh, reduction in crashes, and that's, uh, that'll include vehicular safety as well as uh, pedestrian and bicycle uh, safety as well. Carl, you're up. Carl Rasmussen, 3136 Dance Drive, Stevens Point. And my question is in reference to the traffic circle at uh, 4th and, and North Division. And in particular, the pedestrian safety uh, model and how that fits within the design, uh, that your design that's presented. And in particular, I heard this evening that there is an option to signalize that intersection, which I in, intrinsically I understand would be an, as an improvement uh, based on the, the uh, pedestrian count at that, at that intersection. I was wondering in particular how many other traffic circles exist, particularly in the state of Wisconsin or the Midwest, that would reflect what I perceive as a disproportionate amount of pedestrian crossings that occur at that intersection 
versus a typical uh, traffic circle such as what would occur up at the um, North Point Road and Division Street. And, you know, do those traffic counts and safety models that are used to say that this is an okay design without signalization uh, reflect that the predominant amount of pedestrian crossings occur in a 15 minute period? Are they, grav you know, are, are they road graded across a one hour period as which they, to, in my mind, would not reflect what would go on in reality? I think a perfect model of what I perceive would occur with this traffic circle without signalization is what would occur now mid-block between Stanley Street and Isidore Street when a critical mass of students occur and just take over the crossing mid-block and shut down traffic. Does your models reflect what happens when a critical mass of students at class change in both directions occur and in essence shut down traffic? Great question, thank you. And then Shannon, do you have any, uh, anything you want to add on this? Because you, you know all the roundabouts in the state, right? That'd be great. Well, I'll take a first shot at it. So there's a lot to that question. Uh, generally, roundabouts have been shown to be uh, safe and in many cases safer than signalized intersections. Uh, and, and one of the main reasons for that is whereas at a signal, the pedestrian and the motorist rely on what the signal is telling them what to do. Um, if somebody makes a mistake, that can lead to uh, an, an incident. Whereas with roundabouts, it's more dependent on interaction. So a pedestrian comes up to the crossing, uh, they look for the, for the motorist, they make that eye connection, and then they, they're able to cross after that. Now, the, um, <laughs> now, as far as specifically, you know, safety concerns where where roundabouts are at high pedestrian locations. Um, that's something where um, I, I, I'm not sure the answer to whether or not they specifically account for uh, high pedestrian influx at that area. I do know there's one example, I believe it's over in River Falls, near UW River Falls, there's a roundabout that's uh, right next to, uh, right next to the, the campus with a, a parking lot on the other side of it. And I haven't heard any concerns uh, with that roundabout. But generally speaking, roundabouts and pedestrians, pedestrian safety at roundabouts has proven to be, um, they've proven, yeah. proven to be okay. safe. I, I was just assuming that I perhaps may have yielded the mic too soon because it's not a singular activity with one pedestrian making eye contact, which I've maneuvered through traffic circles, both on bike and, and, and by foot. And I know how that works and how you can stop a vehicle. But in the hundreds of students that, that occur at that, cro at that crossing now with signalized uh, stopping, I think that's, I think we have the, the impetus going on where students will take over because they get impatient. And it's that impatient I, that I think is going to be the problem for safety. Um, I guess I'll just, I'll just answer in general. Um, I don't know all the roundabouts in the state, but we did uh, ha have this question answered when we talked to the city here a few weeks ago um, about that particular location. And it's, it's interesting, certainly, given the pedestrian volumes there, um, how that interacts with the roundabout. And, you know, we kind of looked at if there were any other similar lo locations statewide um, with a high traffic volume, and there there really wasn't many that we came up with. Um, one that I, I did get some feedback on is there's um, one over there in the Sheboygan area that is between um, a, a parking lot and a large um, a large plant, 
and there's there's kind of peaks and valleys of pedestrian traffic that interacts with the roundabout and that seems to be working very well but I also heard that they are using the RRFBs which are the re rectangular um, rapid flashing um, beacons that that's installed on business 51 right now by uh, the YMCA there so they actually use those in conjunction with the roundabout to help with the pedestrian crossing and that seems to be functioning there so that would be an option I'm not saying that the roundabout is a good idea there or not but that's something that would certainly need to be considered Carl if it's all right I want to try and rephrase your question because this is a huge concern of mine as well so I'll rephrase it for the folks at AECOM. Um, we have 600 people crossing that intersection every day, not orderly. About 10 minutes to every hour, and you gotta chuckle because some of those people don't look up and don't make eye contact, they're looking at their phone. Uh, that currently happens in front of the fire station, and I know the chief can, can vouch for that because we've had close calls where they push the RRFB and walk without looking. Um, to see it, we had a semi that had to lock them up and got a call from the YMCA, big story. Anyway, think of everybody in this room heading out to the parking lot right now. The hallway is your intersection and they're in groups of no more than two or three and about 10 feet apart. To get all these people out here, that, that 10 minutes to the hour, it becomes very congested for that 10 minute period. That has the potential, in my opinion, to back up traffic in that roundabout because you could effectively stop all traffic in the roundabout until the pedestrians have passed. Is there anything in your model that has been tested with those numbers? Do you have any real life situations where there's a similar set of circumstances? Um, and if so, where? Uh, so to answer that question, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm aware of a situation that, that sounds the same as that. Um, but I, I'll also say that um, the bottom line is it sounds like there's some issues out there today with the intersection. So today when those students get antsy and they go across the road um, when it's showing don't walk, then you've got a vehicle going through the intersection at you know 25 to 35 miles per hour who's not expecting to see a pedestrian there. Um, compared to the whole idea of a roundabout is you're slowing traffic down to 10 to 15 miles per hour. So if you do get a situation like that, I think it'll be a much uh, less severe situation. But yes, we do acknowledge that there's, uh, you know, we, we understand the concern and it's certainly something that we'll have to think about more. I would, I would suggest that the students do obey that don't walk in that crossing, by and large. It's not the issue of safety. It's the ability to have a good traffic flow as well as a good pedestrian flow. But I think in the absence of slowing them down, slowing down the pedestrian and stopping them is, is what would give you the, the added measure of safety. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Craig? And then anybody else in these three sections? First of all, I wanted to expand on what this gentleman asked here. Uh, you told him that uh, he didn't anticipate a reduction in traffic. Uh, I would like to know uh, what you based that assumption on. In other words, going from four lane to two lane, what made you, what made that assumption that there's going to be automatically less traffic when you do that? Uh, so we, we did not make assumption there would be less traffic. So uh, the way we evaluate this is we start out with existing traffic volumes and then we prepare a forecast and that forecast is based on some growth rates that are anticipated based on historical growth rates and anticipated future growth. And so we 
we take that forecast and we use that as our, our starting point for uh, the traffic volumes that we evaluate. And based on that traffic modeling that we've done, the uh, roadway as shown can accept the amount of traffic that's anticipated to be there in the future. So that's based on uh, actual figures, actual numbers that you put together. That's correct. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, next to ask uh, uh, is that uh, uh, has there been a determination as to what percent decrease in accidents, as you said before, as far as safety is concerned, has been due to a potential decrease in traffic? Now, you're saying that it isn't, but I'm just asking you if there is a decrease in traffic, in many places, I've got to think that there would have been for four lane to two lanes, and then you say, well, it's safer. Maybe some of that safety is that some of that safety because you got less traffic going through there. Less traffic, less accidents. Sure. Uh, yeah, so the, the models that we ran to calculate the anticipated reduction in crashes, I think the figure I threw out was about a, a third, about a 30 to 35 percent reduction in crashes. That's assuming all the traffic that is there today will be there under that future condition. So not assuming any decrease in traffic. But there hasn't been any study on that. Let, let me try and rephrase it again, Craig, because I think I know where you're coming from. We had a list of lane reductions in Wisconsin um, that have already been implemented. Do we know what the traffic count was prior to it and after it? Did it decrease? Did it stay the same? And if it did decrease, did they attribute that to the lower accident rates? I'm not aware of anywhere where a road diet has been implemented that there's been a reduction in traffic as a result of that. Uh, we do know the one that I highlighted was on Stanley Street. Uh, that one, the, the traffic has actually increased between 2017 and 2021. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, I don't know if that's an accurate comparison, but, uh, and, and I, I just, you know, evidently there isn't anything there. Uh, also, uh, the other thing is, I wanted to say, uh, has there been anything any study that's been determined to see if there's a change in business valuation uh, after changing something from a four lane to a two lane. Because after all, if you have less traffic, you know how, how it works with, with uh, real estate, location, location, location. Now, we're, if, if uh, you've got less people going by, there may be a change in valuation, change in the business itself, in other words, how much business it does, and then a change in valuation of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the properties itself. Has there been any uh, study on that? Good evening, Ryan Kurnowski, Director of Community Development. Um, essentially, the case studies that are out there indicate that property values do not decrease based on a road diet. A good example would be Thomas Street in the city of Wausau. In fact, a lot of the businesses that are on that corridor now have uh, been reconstructed or rebuilt. New businesses have come in. So it's highly unlikely that the value of the business, either the assessed value or the fair market value, be decreased because of the road diet. But you haven't done a study. Not within the corridor itself, but there are case studies in other communities that we can look at. If what I'm afraid of is, I'm just wondering what would happen once, once that goes through and these people, including myself, loses the business valuation. I put $60,000 in the community animal hospital to make it a commercial duplex. And now, not just to mention the price I paid to begin with, and now, uh, you know, you can see my concern for asking that question. Yeah, totally understandable. I think one thing that's been brought up a few times is the traffic volume isn't expected to decrease. So if you look at, at property values based on location, 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 if those uh, traffic volumes stay the same, you shouldn't see any type of decrease in the fair market value of the property. So you're basing it on what he's saying is that there's, so you're basing it on he's saying that there's less traffic, so therefore you're saying there's less business valuation. Is that correct? No. No. What I'm saying is the traffic volume won't decrease because of the four to three conversion. 
uh, the volume will stay the same or increase as what the uh, AECOM's been forecasting. So I don't foresee the, the fair market value or the assessed value of those properties to decrease. But you have no real basis for it, in other words. I, see, what I'm trying to get at is the numbers. The numbers to tell me, all these questions that I asked, the numbers to tell me if these, this is correct or if it's just, you know, coming up and saying, well, I assume this is going to happen. I think this is going to happen. I saw this over this way happening, you know, somewhere, instead of just actual numbers. So, Craig, you saw a list of all of the lane conversions that had already occurred in Wisconsin. That's the data you would use. Call the, the businesses along those corridors to see if there's any value change, and we can, get, we can do that. But what we're saying is the ones that they've looked at already, Wausau, was it Thomas Street, right? Thomas Street, that did not happen. Now that doesn't mean it's universal, but we can call those other ones and make sure that the value doesn't de decrease. Um, that is presumptive, of course, on the reduction in traffic. Okay, and you're making an assumption there that Stanley Street, at least, has shown to not decrease traffic volume. I have one more question related to that person, but I've already asked three or four of them, so. Okay, okay. thank you, sir. Thank you. Heidi? Heidi Oberstadt, 524 Buchholz Avenue. Benjamin Oberstadt, also 524 Buchholz Avenue. He has a lot of questions, I'm sure you heard. Sorry to everyone up there if you couldn't hear. Um, I kind of have a three-pronged question. So if our options are broad options, four lanes or three lanes, and my number one priority was safety, and assuming that most people drive and some people walk and some people bike, I feel like that's a pretty safe assumption. Which is a safer option for pedestrians? Our four lane option or a three lane option, or are they the same for pedestrians only? So a three lane option will be a safer option for pedestrians. Um, the, the type of road out there now, the four lane undivided, is a well known safety risk to pedestrians due to uh, it's called the multi-lane threat, which is where when you're crossing the road, you need to get th across four lanes of traffic and nowhere in the middle is there a refuge. So that can be difficult to navigate um, when you're, especially when a lot of times uh, cars can shadow other cars. So you might be looking and you don't see a car, but it might be because it's back behind the other. So that's addressed with the, the three lane option. Okay. Yeah, I totally have experienced that both as a walker and as a driver. Um, sec second prong of that. Out of the four lane option or the three lane option, what is the safest for bicyclists? Um, I think that would be, it might be a little dependent on what the bicycle facilities look like. Um, if we're talking specifically about um, what's out there now versus uh, the three lane that's, that's been proposed, um, the, the existing road out there doesn't have any uh, bicycle uh, facilities right now. Um, there are ha there have been several bicycle crashes out there and a lot of them involve uh, bicyclists riding on the sidewalks. Um, so with the three lane option uh, we do have a bicycle accommodation for much of the corridor, not the whole corridor, um, but generally that would be a, a safer condition for, for bicyclists. Okay, and say that I never walk and I don't ride a bike and I'm a driver. What is the safest option for the drivers? Is it a four lane option or the three lane option? Yeah, it would be the same. The, the three lane option is the safest for the, the automobile driver as well. Okay, that's it. Thanks. You're up, sir. And then we've got one more on this side. So the people on this side, um, start framing your questions and we'll have you queue up on this side of the stage. I'm Tom Real. I live over in Printer Street. I was just curious how do you think the monkey wrench resolution is going to affect this? Speak into the again. I'm just curious as to how you think the monkey wrench resolution that passed is going to affect the funding for this. I, I'm unclear what you mean by monkey wrench resolution. Well, the uh, resolution was just passed that... Uh, the referendum the question? Referendum, yeah. So what that means is uh, if we spend more than a million dollars on a transportation project, it'll have to go to a public vote. That's how it'll affect it. Are you going to do that for, as, for the whole project as one thing or segments? Any segment that costs more than a million dollars, we have to put to a referendum question 
Yes. Well, okay. Um, the other thing is that I just can't understand. Maybe I don't know enough, but I just can't understand how taking four lanes of traffic and reducing them to two lanes of traffic isn't going to cause congestion. You got high, high volume traffic through the area. You get high volume traffic through the area and you got to go down to two lanes as opposed to having four lanes. It just seems like you're going to slow things down and have congestion. Okay. Thank you. All right. Oh, two more. You snuck in on me. Bob Larson, 3283 Lindbergh Avenue, Stevens Point. On your information you received from the citizens on your meetings that you had, I believe 85% of the residents said leave it four lanes. Having this information, did you bring that to the city council and say 85% of the Stevens Point residents wanted four lanes? Who made the decision uh, going against the population of 85% of the city residents that pay taxes? Yeah, I believe the, the question that you're referring to came out on one of the first public surveys for this project. And, 85%. Yep, and I think the question was worded, would lane reductions have detrimental traffic no, impacts? No, it was four lanes. People well, said, we're not going to argue the wording okay. of the question. All right. It was, will a load reduction have a detrimental effect? Yeah. And I think to answer the second part of your question, that information was documented. It was 80-some percent, and we did share that information with the Common Council and anyone else that requested to see the results <laughs> of that survey. Okay. Next real quick question. Division Street, 4th Avenue, about the roundabout. You talk about safety, but you don't tell us the numbers. So I'm going to ask you, how many accidents did we have on Division Street and 4th Avenue from 2018 till the present time? So, Bob, we do have that information. I don't know that we have it at our fingertips right now. That information is available on StevensPoint.com. All of the traffic uh, accident information is available, and whether it was car, 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 bike, car, pedestrian, bike, 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 pedestrian, and so on. I looked at it and couldn't find anything on Division Street and 4th Avenue. Call me tomorrow. We'll get that information out there. If it doesn't exist, if it does exist, I'll send you the link. All right. The last one, can we sell back the Business 51 to the state and maybe get a break? <laughs> Shannon, you're here right now. I, I got, no, Bob, they said no. And honestly, I did ask, and so did Katrina Shanklin. So, um, the answer is no. I'm Steve Keewer. I live on Riverview Avenue on the south side. I'd like to ask you what you're going to do with the three sets of stoplights on the south side. Walgreens, Quick Trip, and the one where uh, Michigan Avenue merges off there. Yep, in the proposed design, all of those, all three of those intersections would remain signalized. Well, given the uh, issue with the traffic flow going from four lanes to two lanes or three lanes, uh, the only way I really see that working is to uh, go to some type of roundabout type of system. I know a lot of people are against roundabouts, but uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I grew up in the south side of Minneapolis. I was there about a year ago. Some of the north, north uh, south side main thoroughfares, Lindale Avenue, Penn Avenue, were four lanes when I lived there. There are now two lanes. They all have roundabouts on them now to maintain the traffic flow. Stoplights, you're going to have traffic backed up all the way across uh, the Dill Pond, in my opinion. Thank you. We appreciate that. We've got about 40 minutes left. This side's exhausted. Cindy, you want to start the other side out? <clears throat> Hello, Cindy Nabel, um, 1100 Phillips Street. 
Um, I'm kind of concerned about the center part, um, knowing that um, there's a lot of pedestrian traffic, at least in the center part of this whole Business 51, um, especially when Carl Rasmussen brought up about 4th Avenue, it's the same way by the, um, the YMCA and then with the RMV that we have already for on, on um, Franklin, I think that's Franklin, um, I've seen so many times where somebody's almost gotten hit because we do have four lanes. Um, two lanes, then everybody stops, and you can see that everybody stopped. Four lanes, you can't always tell if that other lane in that one direction is going to stop or not. And that's where we've seen very many times where people have gotten very close, have gotten hit. Um, I also agree with uh, Rasmussen's comment about Fourth Avenue, that's a real concern. My, my, question is, have you done a count of pedestrians for that section at all? And then also, even for the north and the south side, if we're just looking at besides cars. So the 4th Avenue intersection at Division has about 600 people a day crossing. Okay. And anything on the one that's over by Franklin? Yeah, I don't think we did it at Franklin. Uh, all the signalized intersections in that stretch, we do have traffic counts that include pedestrian counts. Um, but yeah, I don't think we have one at Franklin. Okay. Um, and I also just would like to reiterate that I hate going on the south side because of the four lanes. I often see people not using turning lanes, and I'm tired of the speeders everywhere in this town all the way through division. And if I want to get to Plover fast enough, I'll take the, the interstate or a different road that goes faster. Thank you. All right, next up. Try and keep it into questions. I, I understand everybody has opinions, but we want to try and get questions answered first. We got about another 40 minutes. Were you anticipating that I was giving you an opinion and not a question? No, nope, general. <laughs> okay, my name is Nancy Keller, and I actually do not live in Stevens Point but I do assessments for ADA compliance. And as such, I am um, acutely aware of um, people with vision issues um, using, for instance, uh, the sound of traffic patterns to, as a guide to cross the street. So I'm wondering, with the traffic pattern of a roundabout, it's not as predictable as a, a signalized intersection. So I would like to know what steps are taken to ensure accessibility at the, the roundabouts, not only for people with vision issues, but also for um, people who are wheelchair users or other mobility devices. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. So that's a, it's a known issue at roundabouts that people with um, vision impairments um, sometimes struggle not understanding where, um, where the vehicles are coming from. So that's something that, you know, if, if we become aware that that's a, a, a crossing commonly used by somebody with vision impairments, that's something we'll have to take a look at and um, figure out uh, a solution there. Would that not be locking the barn door after the horse gets out? I, I'm not trying to be argumentative. I'm just thinking to be proactive, to not have to wait until somebody with a vision issue come, has a near miss, and then, oh, well, we better fix the problem. You're absolutely right, and that's something that we're going to have AECOM work on because obviously we don't have the data for that. Uh, but keep in mind, we're not even yet at a 30% design, so we've got a long way to go to figure those things out. Um, we're not the first people to do it. So there should be information out there. And along with the counts of uh, business valuation and traffic counts on all of the other ones listed, we're going to have AECOM get that information together. You can also contact Keller Assessment Services, and I can help you out with that, too. <laughs> all right, so let, let, let's say no opinions and no plugs for your business. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm teasing. Yes, sir. Hello, I'm John Irwin, living in Stevens Point. Um, I was wondering why you uh, put bike lanes on division or our other Stevens Point streets when roughly seven months out of the year, we have winter snow and bad weather making it unusable for riding bikes. I mean, this is Wisconsin. 
I'm going to take that because I'm not a bicyclist either. But I can tell you that people ride their bikes in the winter. And just because they're not used as much, they deserve every right to be on the road as we do. They also need to follow all the rules, just like we should. And vehicle drivers don't do that either. So Putting the bicycle accommodations in is not the biggest priority. Safety is the biggest priority when we're designing this road. If there's room, and there's not bicycle lanes through the whole area either. If there's room, the bicycle lanes will be put in. So with the winter ice and stuff, there's not going to be a safety factor of bikes sliding into cars? Or, or cars versa. sliding into houses? Uh, I mean, the same thing houses? you go through. Yes, winter sucks in Wisconsin, and we're going we're gonna to find that out again real soon. All right, and then the other thing that I'm looking at is that it seems like we've got the city has approved a lot of apartment buildings. You know, we got the one where uh, Kmart was, they built that big one there. We got the one at Point Motel, so we got a big structure there. Um, we got two apartment buildings over by the Point Center uh, uh, Mall, where those went up. Water Street, we got that new apartment building there. That adds a lot more people using the city, as far as Division Street and the traffic. Was this accounted for? And does it seem like the city is going to be knocking down older areas and putting apartment buildings, which would make more traffic cause and division to be used more than what it currently is? I'll take some of uh, Director Karnowski's thunder. We will continue to provide housing options for everyone who needs housing options. Uh, in regards to the increase or potential increase, I'll leave that over to AECOM. When you did your studies, what sort of increases were you looking at over time? Yep, so when we did our traffic study, uh, as I mentioned before, we did put together a traffic forecast. And to do that, we looked at historical trends and then project out into the future. And the historical trend on Business 51 right now is actually negative. We're seeing a decline in traffic over the last uh, several years. Um, but we still did account for a modest growth rate to make sure that uh, because forecasting sometimes is, isn't perfect, we wanted to make sure we had a little buffer there, there so we could handle uh, traffic increase with this roadway. And then also with COVID, it allowed a lot of people working. Also with COVID, people were working in office, used to be working in offices like the big century building they built and started working at their homes. Was that amount of traffic and people accounted for too? It doesn't seem like if you did a count during this time period, you'd be getting accurate counts of traffic because the people aren't at, aren't at the offices. <clears throat> yeah, so it's the, the traffic volumes that we worked with were uh, obtained prior to COVID. So what we're working with was traffic volumes that were um, from 2017 to 2019 when uh, before the work from home uh, started to happen. Thomas? Yep, Thomas Leek, 1253 Franklin. Um, so from the engineering perspective, we've seen some options are safer than others. Uh, some options are safer than others. Others may be more popular than others. So a question here is if, if the city opts for a, an engineering solution that is less safe, does that create legal liability for the city if an accident occurs at, say, a merge point or at an access point? I'm going to answer that because I didn't even think about having the city attorney here. Um, so generally speaking, no. As long as we do our due diligence, uh, you'd have to show negligence for some reason. And that's not going to happen in any design we choose. There are designs we could choose that would probably open us up for things, um, but we're not going to let that happen. Okay, and just one final question. Uh, I mean, at the beginning you had mentioned this, there was a question about, uh, you know, sort of distributing costs, which of course would have been, you know, from a you know, political perspective, undoable. But uh, theoretically, they could donate the land, correct? Okay, well, thank you. Actually, um, and again, the city attorney's not here, but let me, let me tell you this. Legally, we are obligated to pay fair market value. Nobody's getting a windfall. Yeah. Fair market value. I believe we have to pay fair market value, any generous property owners could certainly donate that money back to the city if they chose. Thank you. Anyone here can do that today too. We'll pass around a hat. Mr. Janowski. 
Philip Janowski, uh, 1017 Old Wausau Road. Now, though I don't live in a city, I do use the road as well as pay the, the wheel taxes and all the other taxes on the vehicles. And I'm a bicycle rider myself. And um, I was just doing some comparison contrasts here. I was in the city of Marshfield a few weeks ago with, well, taking someone to the hospital there, and I was looking, they have, they have bike lanes and they have the four lane the four-lane concepts, and they seem to function there, as well as the section of Grand Avenue in Wausau from the south city limits of Wausau to the Marathon County Courthouse. The bike lanes are what they call the Sherrills are painted right in the road, so that the vehicle following the bicycle simply has to yield, you know, and then uh, pass the bicyclist up once the left side is clear and go around, and that seems to function well. And the sidewalks are right next to Grand Avenue in Wausau, my biggest concern about this is I'm worried about all these businesses here. Bill, you got a question, right? These, these, the businesses, what I am worried about here is what's going to happen. And, and, and to begin with, how did this really all come about? It seemed like everything was functioning. If I understand the safety aspects here with, um, with your, um, you know, the, the crash rates and things like that, yes, something has to be done. The roads do have to be improved, but I personally think there's other ways to do it and it should function as a four-lane facility yet. Okay, do you have a question? Well, there's some other ones here. I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get a question uh, out of there, that's why I'm asking. Um, we have people that need questions. Yes, uh, as I said before here, I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned about these businesses, and, and um, you, you alluded here to Stanley Street increasing traffic. Well, yeah, it did increase tra traffic because they built uh, ER at 4100 Stanley Street. And that's a 24-hour facility now, so the traffic will increase there. And as far as, as uh, Division Street and Church Street, it's actually an alternative to Interstate 39, and that's another concern, is, is what happens when, well, uh, originally this year, I mean, about six, seven times the freeway's been closed, and they're probably going to close it again as they're doing construction work. And a week ago today, there was a fatality out here where they, where they pump all the traffic down Business 51. So what happens in those situations? That's the question. Okay, um, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to pull the question out of there though. Can you restate it easy? When there's something going on, an event on the interstate, a major say, well, last week there was a fatality here. I'm sure that, that the fire personnel- So you're asking when they close that. off part of the interstate- When they close the interstate at times, they, they push the traffic. Business 51 is an alternative to Interstate 39. And that don't mean that it's 24-7, but there are times. Now, if this happens like on a busy like holiday weekend, and this is going to be a, a three-lane road, and, and what's going to happen when this traffic's all coming into the city, you know? And, and, uh, and actually, there's emergency and, and fire aspects. Now, you know, like going into the single lane each way, or when the garbage trucks come, things like that, you know? Okay, I've got you. If there's an accident or something and the interstate has to be blocked off, that traffic will get diverted through town. Yes, it does. You're asking what the impact will be. Yes. The impact will be that the traffic comes through town. Yes, and it backs up. It gets crazy. It, it will, but it's going to do me. that now. It's yes. going to do that today. If yes. we have to reroute traffic anywhere, it gets congested on the alternate routes. That's, Correct. Those are very few, hopefully less so. With, exactly. We don't want fatalities and we don't want accidents. Uh, but those are, those are anomalies to what the norm is, and we can't design anything based on what the worst case scenario is going to be. Oh, well, yes. Makes sense? Makes sense. Sorry. I, does make sense. Add? Chief, anything to add there? You can if you want. Yeah, that's not a problem. I could okay. Chief, you might as well come down too. You thought you were going to get away with it, didn't you? <laughs> come on down and talk about what happens real briefly, because we got... Well, personally, we should have law enforcement and fire and EMS personnel comment on these projects, too. Well, here they are. I'm glad they are. They're the ones that patrol it. So uh, the question being if the interstate has to be closed for a certain reason and rerouted traffic throughout the city. This actually just happened this past week on Thursday evening yes, in the did. middle of the night. Um, between the City of Stevens Point Fire Department and the Portage County EMS uh, Ambulance and working with DOT, we function with the State of Wisconsin DOT 
And depending on where that accident occurs out on the interstate is how we reroute traffic throughout the city. This accident where it occurred, it actually used two different DOT standard reroutes and we worked with the department uh, DPW within the, within the city to reroute all of that traffic and it worked flawlessly. We closed down the interstate both north and south, both lanes of traffic, and we had traffic rerouted within a matter of a half hour and continued to keep that traffic rerouted through the city throughout most of the night while uh, the uh, troopers were able to reconstruct that accident. Okay. So, and it does not happen that often, but when it does, we do have standards that we do follow. Right. And I, and it I got caught up in it, and I just thought that, you know, I mean, if it happens during the day, like during the rush hour or something, it could be more of a problem. We're, we're like that. also prepared for that. So we also have uh, um, Tim's training. We send out units ahead of time to actually use and uh, coordinate off lane one or lane two traffic. We dump them off onto side streets. We'll actually close down the on and off ramps at different sites to make sure that not only our members of EMS, fire, and law enforcement are safe, but also for your safety in rerouting that traffic. Okay. Chief Cuso, anything to add? <laughs> He's just gonna come up here and say, yeah, what he said. Yes, sir. Alrighty, so Neil Wasinski, 396 Old Wasser Road. Now, uh, what was the exact date that we did our traffic studies that vet validates all these claims that you guys are talking about today? Well, first of all, there were multiple traffic studies. Do you have those dates handy? Were they on any of these slides? I know that that information is available on our website at stevenspoint.com. The dates of the, the traffic studies, so they're on there. Yeah, because as uh, somebody was saying earlier, I saw 2020, and I don't know if we look around, that is not an accurate study. So no, the first one was done in 2017. That was on the slide earlier. You must have seen that one, right? Okay. I just thought I'd ask that question. I guess my other question is, too, you know, as you said earlier, cheaper isn't always better. Why, you know, don't we look into options here? Because we have to build this right. We're only going to get one shot, 50, 60 years to build this right. Why don't we ask Cana you know, Canadian Rails to go and pitch some money since, you know, see if they want to redo that bridge, make it easier for us because obviously that bridge is old. If you're going to tear it out, now is the time. We did ask. The answer was no. Okay. And, and I apologize for not having the, the numbers on the traffic study. I didn't think it necessary to bring the information that's been available on the website for the better part of two years. Um, I didn't have that information printed out. So I apologize for that, uh, but that information is available on the website. All right, good deal. Thank you. Keith. Keith Kudrowski, 1536 Water Street. <clears throat> I promise I behave too, so. 30% is at the north end or is that 10%, 10%, 10%? 10%? Well, gotcha. North end. It's wide enough. The sidewalks have a boulevard between, there's grass between the sidewalks. The median is there. Why do we have to change this footprint and make it three lanes? Maybe in the middle here again, it, it becomes the same old argument. The middle's tricky. The two ends have businesses that are relying on traffic. If I decide, if I'm driving by, and I decide I'm coming into town that's got one lane, I'm probably not coming into town. I'm going to hit, well, I won't go to McDonald's because I refuse to eat there, but I'm not coming into the town that has one lane that's going to force traffic into one lane. It's not going to work. I don't care what you say. If you take a foot wide flow of water and you make it six inches, it's longer. It's more. It backs up. I don't get the whole change on the front end. So why is the north end got to be shrunk to three? Why can it not stay four lanes? There's a median. It's there. The footprint is there. And, and I'm going to make a statement, and then I'll have E come talk about it. The short answer is we can. Okay. We can't keep it four lanes. You see this here? Yep. This was one of the slides earlier. They went through the evaluation on all of those criteria and scored them out. The highest scoring one was the two lane with the raised median. That doesn't mean we can't do the four lane with the raised median. 
Just means it's okay. scored lower. And I'll let AECOM talk about how their scoring went. Okay, there, that's. <clears throat> uh, correct me if I missed in your question there. Let's change the slide. But I believe what you're asking is why couldn't there be a four lane in the north segment compared to the two lane? Absolutely. Okay. And I think the answer to that question is it could be a four lane. But what we did is we set criteria that was equally weighted and it had the 15 different criteria, I could go back to a previous slide, that takes into account things such as right away, um, um, cost, public input, and other items. And it compares them based on a total score. So our scoring system had the two lane coming out as more favorable. It's not to say that the four lane option couldn't be done, but the two lane option in this situation and in this scoring was a higher scoring alternative. So why does it have to be a raised median? I mean, there's a median there that has a bump that makes you acknowledge there other than trees, which are pretty, but very worthless as far as traffic flow, pedestrian crossings, bicycles driving, Why? And Jeff, I might let you speak on this a little bit, but I think that the raised median is what brings the safety aspect to that alternative. It provides um, dedicated left turn lanes for vehicles turning so they're not stopped in a through lane. It also helps control access because there has been a significant amount of access related crashes in there. And that raised median in the center for pedestrians, it also allows a place for pedestrians to stop so they only have to cross one direction of traffic at a time and not crossing two directions. So that raised median is really required to have the safety aspect of it. And without it, it wouldn't score near as well. So you only need a raised median at a crosswalk is what you're saying. No, because we're saying that at sometimes when the raised median's there, that allows for dedicated left turn lanes, and those don't just occur at a crosswalk. You can make a dedicated left turn lane on that on that strip right out here. You don't it doesn't have to be raised. I'm missing the whole because that's expensive. It's way more expensive than going with the flat method we have and you can cut the turn lane in there. You can raise it at the intersection so the pedestrian has somewhere to talk. I'm, I'm sorry, there's no reason this has gotta be three lanes on a north end. I'm sorry, it's a business killer. And, and I'll, I'll restate that again, Keith. It doesn't have to be three okay. lanes. And it shouldn't be. Three lanes scores higher on those criteria. I'm, I'm just that, told, that's, that's it. An the answer is not going to change for you. That criteria is. is someone else's opinion. Maybe, that's, but, but that's not going to change anything, Keith. It, uh, based on the criteria we selected, it scored higher. Score. It's, it's close. It's Man, close. Um, so the, the short answer to your question is: it doesn't have to be four lane. Yeah. I mean three lane. It doesn't have to be four lane either. Right. We'll go to roundabout two, and uh, I'm sorry that one does. Do not you got work. another question? Keith? I do. Okay, good. Why the roundabout? Because are you going to tell me that pedestrians look and without control, they assume the right of way because they have one of these, that's not a wallet, <laughs> they have their phone. Nobody pays attention. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you that. Human behavior so, is unpredictable. So that's, that to me, that is the biggest waste because it's not going to work. It's got to be controlled. It's got to be controlled to stop the pedestrian, to stop the cars. So. I got you, Keith. Right. We got anybody else that has a question? I'm trying to gauge time here. We got about 15 minutes left and four people. So I think we're okay right now. Anyone else? All right, Stefan. Uh, Stefan Klein, 301 Union Street. Um, as a contractor and tree man I, I just had a few thoughts um, I noticed the bike lanes were taken out of a section there and one uh, in the process of constructing things you know how to get services in and out is not really a major consideration because you work it into the plan but maintenance wise you know I'm just looking you know say someone needs to replace their driveway or the city's replacing sidewalks now that it's the city that handles that. Um, you need to park a concrete truck somewhere for two to four hours um, or a boom truck to work on a tree for half a day. Um, 
how is that going to affect traffic? Is there going to be somewhere for traffic to go with um, a fall zone covering roughly nine feet of the roadway? In, in a situation like that, it would actually be very similar to what it is today. I mean, we'd have to just block off part of the of the roadway. So even in the central section where there isn't, we're talking about three lanes. You know, we simply have to look at the design that contractors coming up with, and we just have to do a lane shift into the the twiddle. So we'd have traffic flowing in each direction, you know, over that shortest distance to get it. And that, you know, I can't think of too many scenarios where that wouldn't necessarily work until you get into very specific, very you know, infrequent things that may otherwise impact us. The, the, one, the one concern I have, and, and part of the reason you don't see it coming up, is because usually when you're talking about private properties, private drives, private trees, the city doesn't take it into consideration, and, and, um, and, and it's usually just on the onus of the property owner. And some of those houses are really close. Oh, sorry. Uh, some of those houses are really close, and you're, you're going to have... Um, where where you can't get that work vehicle off that road and so as it is now you can cone off a section and they go into the other lane typically and like you say it's rare but when it does happen it it can cause some major issues um, is there going to be somewhere for that traffic to go if you have a nine foot wide vehicle on the side of the road for six hours working. And, and really we'd have to look at that you know, situation to see you know, how it otherwise fits, because I don't know if you're talking specifically about a vehicle that could straddle the curb, or does it need to be on level ground completely within the concrete area? It's, it's you know, a very we, situational we to, thing. Right, so we, you know, we need to do that, but typically speaking, within nine feet, if we have an 11 foot lane within there plus a curb space, we'd push that out there, we have the twiddle, we would direct traffic you know, going into the twiddle, and we just require the contractor would follow the MUTCD standards and then create a merge to go into that and assume the, the twiddle to get around the work zone. Very similar to what we do today, just taking from one lane to the other. Right, and, and the short answer, Stefan, too, is if it's bigger than that, you just close off the road and you create a detour. Same thing we do now if a water main breaks or there's a big accident or the underpass floods. Well, what those accommodations The bottom line is that's what would the happen issue, if you needed to cut yeah. down a tree. The, the issue I'm getting at is typically those accommodations won't be made for a private residence. And so the private residence is just like, well, I guess you just can't replace your driveway. I guess the tree just grows until it falls on the house. And that's, that seems to be the answer with a lot of these situations. Uh, when you have... We wouldn't let anything or become even public safety like, hazard. Like Michigan has the bike lane, and with the bike lane, the road is wide enough that if you just put out traffic cones, they can veer into that. Um, I'm just wondering, without that bike lane in that section, will there still be enough space for such work? Yeah, and as the director said, depending on the width of the vehicle, the fall zone, all of that would be taken into consideration, but we would not let anything become a public safety hazard. Name and address, sir. Brock Maddox, 5421 Monroe Avenue, Plover, Wisconsin. So we've been involved in uh, this process for well over a year, um, attended over 10 uh, city council meetings. And uh, there was a percentage earlier, about 85% of the people in the community um, opposed this uh, three-lane deal. And uh, since I got involved, We've set records in every single city council meeting. You, I'm sure you know uh, 40, 50, 70 people in there every time. And the overwhelming majority of these people in this community, um, they know what they want. They live here. They travel these roads every day. Very qualified individuals of this community. Um, pay, uh, they plow these roads. They ride the school buses. The emergency crew is here. They know this community. They know what they want. Um, by the way, I want to thank everybody. Thank you guys for having this for this community today. There's 170 people here. So I want to say thank you for that. But um, one thing about this uh, city council, um, the totalitarian 
the no's, the no's, the no's every time. Every one of these majority uh, of these meetings. I have a question for you here. Get to the okay. question, please. We got 10 minutes left. The overwhelming majority in every one of these meetings, these people opposed this three lane deal here in the city council, every one of them except one individual that's here today. No, 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 no. My question is to you and the city council, at what point, no means no, do you listen to we the people that pay these taxes? Nobody's gonna be able to answer that for you, Brock. Uh, all right, next up. Next up. You're on. The answer is he's not going to get an answer because this is related to business 51 and has nothing to do with the council or their individual opinions. The, the, the older person's information is available on the website. Sir, I'm going to ask you to leave right now. Officer, could you please just escort this man out? Gentleman in the red shirt right there, blue hat. You're up, ma'am. Gracia Day, 300 Union Street, Stevens Point. Um, instead of a roundabout, what if we went with a signal and perhaps used that land that would need to be acquired for a bridge for the students or anybody? I mean, that would be the ADA compliant thing. Is, there, is that an option that's been considered? Th that is a good question. Um, it is an option that's been considered. It's expensive. Uh, but AECOM, I'm going to see if anybody here wants to chime in on that. There's not going to be enough land to make the bridge. Okay. We'd have to acquire more land to do it. Mm -hmm. S simple answer. Um, and it's really expensive. Okay. Anything you want to add? Come on. Yeah. Yeah, just real quick. Uh, you know, when it comes to pedestrian bridges, you also want to make sure it's in a location where it'll actually get used. Um, and with a lot of access available along Business 51, it's questionable whether or not the pedestrians would use it. And as the mayor mentioned, it, it'd be very costly. So it's something we can consider, but those are things we'd have to take into account. Okay. And then, Mr. Mayor, you mentioned that you would um, do some recon on how these affected other areas and the businesses in those areas. Will you make that available so the rest of us can see that? Because I am concerned about how this reduction is going to affect the small businesses. Absolutely. I know the information is out there. We just don't have it compiled. Everything we do is out, going to be out on that website. If you uh, search the city website for the Business 51 stuff, it will all be out there, including the video from this. Thank you. Mr. Rourke, name and address, sir. Trevor Rourke, 601 Washington, Stevens Point. Um, so questions about uh, the 4th Avenue uh, roundabout planned and the design there. So it's been stated um, there's roughly 600 pedestrians per day. Um, so calculating that out, that's roughly 25 pedestrians per hour. And then further extrapolated, it's roughly 2.4 pedestrians per minute. So I'm wondering from either DOT or a traffic engineer from AECOM, if 2.4 pedestrians per minute is going to impede traffic. Trevor, I'm gonna stop you there because it's not 600 and then you break it down every hour because nobody's crossing it at three in the morning, probably. Those are in flows, um, so it's not 1.2 a minute or whatever your number 2 was. 2.4, it's av average, four. right? Right, they're in flows, as you know, you worked at the university, 10 to the hour, that's when everybody gets out. That's when you have your peaks. But I'll let AECOM answer that based on that number. Yeah, that's correct. I, I, the 600 per day is, is not spread out evenly. We do have some groupings at, at you know, the end of class time. Um, but as we mentioned before, I think that's something that um, we'll have to maybe take a little, little closer look at because we know that's a, a concern with a number of pedestrians there. Thank you. Name and address, please. Here we got one more. Is there anybody else? We've got about five minutes left. <coughs> Jump in line over there, Keely. Anybody else? Get in line, please. Right. Name and address, you're up. Carrie, Stevens Point. 
I see Wiza and Flatoff routinely saying that we can have four lanes if we just expand one foot on either side of the corridor. Where is this coming from? Is this accurate? I'm not asking you because I don't believe anything you say. I need the professionals to answer. So I think to answer your question, four lanes and does it fit in the right of way depends on where you're at in the corridor. In areas like the north segment, the four lane raised median, that does fit within the existing right of way. In areas such as the south segment and the central segment, I believe you mentioned a foot and that is not correct. It does not fit within the existing right of way plus a foot on each side. Oh, okay. So let me get this straight. South side, middle side, one section or one foot on either side is not enough to have four lanes. That's incorrect information? Okay, so so what did you say on the Facebook? I don't, you know what, forget it. You don't know what you're talking about, obviously. So one foot on either side won't cut it. Flat off's wrong, Weeza's wrong. You're absolutely right. One foot on each side won't cut it. Next question. Jim Smith, 801 Division Street. Uh, this is going to affect me more than anybody. And right now, to get out of the driveway, I either have to wait for students to cross on 4th and a red light on Division Street. And the traffic is bad from 11 to 1, 2.30 to 4, and 8 to 9. And do you have figured out for the fire station to get out and the YMCA? There's going to be a line in the middle there. Okay. He's, he's talking about the peak flows. So when peak traffic volumes are up during those times of day, um, have, has that been taken into consideration? Yes, our traffic study did include analysis of the different peak hours. So we did evaluate traffic that happens at those times when the flow is busiest during the day. And if there's a bus broke down by the YMCA, the traffic is back up to 4th Avenue. How, well, that's all I have to say. No, Smitty, and I, I, I understand where you're coming from. The, the bus broke down, I mean, those aren't things that we necessarily plan for. Those are unique situations, and when they come up, they may require different unique solutions. Cones around it, barricades around it, diverting traffic off to a side street, those sorts of things, but those are pretty unique. Okay? Yes, sir, name and address. Hi, my name is Lionel Weaver. I live at uh, 17. 08 Clark Street, right in the uh, what we're calling the center segment. Um, my question, I think, is going to be a little bit different from uh, uh, many of the questions tonight, and it's really a question about methodology. And uh, you laid out the slide with the criteria that was used. We've had a process that we've gone through. Um, I think it would be helpful just to understand how, how did you arrive at that. I I assume that you didn't just make it up, so. Were you basing it on professional standards, best practices? Um, I just think if, if you could explain a little bit about how you arrived at the system that ultimately drove this process, it, it would be useful. Thank you. Yep, and the criteria that you're mentioning, that is available on the public web, or the project website if you do want to take a look at it. But it is based on a combination of things. As you mentioned, professional standards, um, relative impacts within the corridor comparing the level of impacts among themselves so it's based on a multitude of items but that information is available on the website if you do want to take a, a look at it yeah I, i'm not question sorry i wasn't questioning the the criteria and, and i did see it i just thought it might be useful just for a little bit more context about how you put it together that's all <clears throat> yeah as as far as how we put it together um, there's 15 different criteria and it is based on a scoring system of one to five and most of it is quantitative whereas you go into the scoring you can see that one may have a low level of impact and then five has a high level impact so it varies based on the different criteria and the different item that you're looking at but it is a quantitative 
item that you can look at and compare between one and five? Elder Fischler, District 10. I know that there have been a lot of concerns about how emergency vehicles would get through on a re, uh, lane, the lane reduction. So I was hoping that um, either um, the fire chief or the police chief could elaborate on how that would work. So as everyone knows, the Fire headquarters is located at 1701 Franklin Street. We're right off of Division Street. Uh, we are in the center corridor of this project. And moving forward, everyone also knows that there are all different types of lane configurations throughout the city that we operate in. Whether there's two, three, or four lanes of traffic, uh, we operate the same uh, as emergency services. So whether we're operating like everyone else is with those emergency apparatuses in a non-emergent capacity, we'll operate just like all of you. In an emergent capacity, we actually then will operate just like we're operating right now in different aspects of the city. So if we respond down to certain sections of the city that are two lanes, that's how we will continue to operate. If we operate uh, where we're currently operating in three lane areas, we will continue to operate that way and four lanes the same. Just remember if we are in an emergent capacity that we do ask you to merge to the right, pull over and stop for us so we can pass to the left. And that if we are going to be fighting a fire on Division Street, just like we would be now, whether it's four lanes, three lanes or two lanes, more than likely we are going to be closing off that road for emergency purposes and rerouting with police um, barricades or using DPW for long-term process. So the fire department does not see any issues with this proposed package at this time. Chief Kusov, I'm gonna let you sit back there. Do you have anything to add? Emergency operations pretty much runs the same way. All right, thank you. Sir, name and address for the record. Jeremy Slowinski, 1815 Elm Road North, beautiful Junction City. <laughs> I guess I have a couple questions and it's kind of, they just spurred in the last um, uh, minutes here. Um, I guess regarding the, the, the statement was made earlier today, tonight, regarding driveways, I'm, I'm particularly speaking on the south end. Uh, is there, and I guess this might be a question for Chief Cuso, is there an excessive amount of accidents due to, um, I guess, ingress, egress onto the current corridor t t causing us to reduce these driveways? Because I know this is one of the biggest contentions for the south side businesses is the eliminating of driveways. Is there that much of an issue where you need to eliminate these driveways? I don't know if that's something Chief Cuso can provide information. Is there excess accidents right now? If, Chief, you want to provide something, you can, but I'll just mention that on the project website, there is that information where we do have a percentage calculated, and I apologize, I don't have it in front of me, but it does mention the specific amount of access-related crashes that have occurred throughout the corridor. And they're excessive? Requiring removal of driveways. Like I said, I don't have the number in front of me, but it is available on the project website. And are they excessive? Because that would be the reason why you would eliminate them. Hey, Jared, Jeremy. Yes. I believe the, uh, the majority of the accidents are intersection-related. There are some aggressive access. So there is not an issue, but yet you're going to remove driveways. Okay, thank you. So what the chief said, for those of you listening on the recording, is that most of the accidents that occur in that stretch are intersection related and not ingress, egress related. However, okay. the potential exists and that's what they're trying to do. Okay, next question. How many years has AECOM been working on this corridor for the city taxpayers from the start? Rhetorical question, Jeremy, you were there. About 2011? I record, huh? 29, 2009, somewhere in that range. And how many millions of dollars have you soaked the taxpayers for this 
Jeremy, we're still Jeremy, right, no, we're no, still no. Right we're not going to deal with that. We're not going to deal with that kind of attack. When we started, Thank we're you. not going to deal with that kind of attack. Council approved the payment, and that's what they're going to get. Do we have any other questions? Mr. Moresi, name and address, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Vincent Moresi, 1008 6th Ave on the north side. Uh, it's been a really serious night here tonight, everybody, so I wanted to just end on this little bit of levity. Question. It is a question. Um, so uh, the, it's touching on the, the roundabout intersection on 4th Avenue and the concern that um, students may take over the intersection. I was in a, 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 a committee meeting the other day for the county board and a fellow supervisor uh, told a story. And he said that in 1986, uh, the students took over the intersection uh, as after they pushed over a point beer truck and started to drink beer in the intersection. So uh, on, on that note, I, I don't have a question. I totally- You lied to I, me. I, I did, but- <laughs> You lied to I, me. I did it on purpose because That's that was- it. you're done. That was the <laughs> only problem uh, with <laughs> students taking over the intersection. I just wanted to provide some levity. So I do remember that story. Together, so. um, Thank you. I did attend UWSP in 1986, so yeah. All right, all right, uh, we've had the questions exhausted. I am gonna ask um, maybe Scott or someone from AECOM. What do you need, Keith? No, you got to come up to the microphone. I'm going to ask about lane widths on the south side. So, wait, right, it's it's you're more. Not gonna, you're going to ask no, a question, yes, right? Yes, I am. You're not going to. So opinion. yes, right. I am. So I asked the chief. How does the sheriff say something totally opposite of how people react on a bike lane, three lane? He, because he screams about it on 66 on Stanley Street where nobody knows where to go. You're assuming people know what to do. I'm sorry, in today's day and age, I don't even know, do they, do they take driving lessons anymore? I don't think they physically have to go. They didn't for a while. Kids were getting their driver's license without, but I want to know how he comes to the conclusion He's that. a different person. I can't speak for what the sheriff okay. is and nobody in this room but can. But he's saying that this 346-1500. Okay, I'm going to say this is going to be an issue because the sheriff's dealt with this. Yes, more so. understood. All right, gentlemen, lane widths on the south side. What are the existing lane widths? Can someone look on the board? If I remember when we talked about it, they were 10 feet or nine feet and 10 feet. Is that what they were? No, I know it varies, I know, so I but generally speaking, the there's nothing less than nine feet. Nothing less than nine feet. I want to say the Joel, do you see anything less than nine feet up there? No. Okay. Which board? By where Jeremy is with the baseball cap? We've got eight foot widths. And That's existing. That is existing. All right, and the minimum lane width uh, is what? 10 foot. 10, Ten foot. foot. Okay, not recommended. What's the minimum required? 10, 11 to 12 recommended. 10 feet. I just wanted to be clear on that because the lanes are close. A foot on each side was never said. All right, uh, with that, all of this information, along with the video, is going to be posted on our website in a couple of days. Give it till Monday, probably tomorrow, but uh, Monday for sure. We're not at that 30% design yet. Your comments or suggestions, as long as they're constructive, um, can be sent to the, community, or the uh, public works director, and we'll make sure they get to AECOM. Uh, if you have questions about anything else, feel free to contact my office. Contact your older person. Many of them are here. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. I know you didn't get all of the answers you wanted, but we gave you the honest answers to the best of our ability. Thank you. For more information about the Business 51 project, visit stevenspoint.com slash business51 or call 715-346-1564.